Um, uh, so I, I was asked to um, lead a discussion on gap phases of correlated matter in the framework of operator algebras. And this can, of course, uh, still mean uh, a, a lot of things. Um, but I'm going to interpret it as, uh, as a, a discussion about um, sort of the, the, the talks uh, early this weekend, including this morning, that uh, were specifically about interacting systems. Um, there's a lot to say, and so I'm going to uh, review a few things uh, so that we have sort of a common language and remind ourselves of what that common language is. Um, and uh, for, the, for the experts, this will be uh, offensively repetitive, but uh, it, I hope you will bear with me. I, I will not speak too long. I'll try to keep this short and, and, and we can head into the discussion. Um, so, so here is, is an outline, but this will go fairly quickly. And so it ends, as you see, with uh, discussion topics. And I have a few there, but that, uh, in, in no means do I, uh, by no means do I mean to restrict the number of topics and, and the type of things that can be discussed. If, uh, uh, it sort of relates to, to the topic, it's, it, it's, it's fair game. So I, uh, my suggestions are, are definitely not meant to be uh, uh, restricted of the discussion we can have. Um, so I will, I will re repeat things mostly. Um, to start, uh, the, the setting has been introduced with variations uh, by, uh, by Peter and Lukas and Anton and uh, the, the other speakers. And um, so let me, I, I will go very quickly, but nevertheless, uh, let's fix some notation. Hi, Emil, I, I see you're there. So I, I, uh, I, I started. I, well, thank you. I was sure you would catch up. I went for a coffee. <laughs> I thought you didn't need breaks. You act like you don't need breaks. But <laughs> this is good. <laughs> All right. So, um, so as as we, we we heard today and and uh, other days, um, we uh, consider lattice systems typically where the the so the many degrees of freedom uh, that we are talking about, the many particles or the many spins or the many fermions. Um, we consider them on a lattice, and, and, and so let's just focus on, on the, the spin case or the so-called bosonic case. Um, and uh, as has been said by other speakers, also the, the fermion case is, is similar. There are some differences. It's not, not that it, it shouldn't be dis discussed in detail, um, but this whole setup is very similar and the techniques are very similar. So let's take the, the bosonic case. So then we have, uh, a Hilbert space, uh, Hx, and x is uh, a, a point in the lattice. And the lattice, uh, it could be a real lattice, or it could be some discrete matrix space that is not too wild. Um, uh, Delaunay set or something like that. We want it to be typically uh, embeddable in a reasonable way in a finite dimensional Euclidean space or in some manifold. Um, for concreteness, uh, to get the discussion started, we can just think about, think about uh, the, the hypercubic lattice. And then we have our finite dimensional Hilbert space. It's for many things not strictly necessary. It's finite dimensional, but let's, just, let's assume it is. Um, and then we have our algebra of local observables, um, which uh, associated with any finite subset lambda, um, as Amanda just explained, these uh, algebras of local observables are included in each other. You can always extend by identities. And so you can take the union, make sense of this, uh, complete it, and get a nice uh, C star algebra of quasi local observables. Um, should I admit? Uh, yes, I am. Or somebody does that? OK, thanks. Um, and we call the, uh, so when we say that A is supported in lambda, we mean that uh, um, A is in one of these local algebras. So uh, strictly speaking, you could define the support as the, the smallest lambda for which this holds. 
And so this is the first point, and, and I think Peter also uh, stressed this very much uh, in all of this, and in the study of physical properties of many body systems, this locality structure is, is really very crucial. And of course, it's always been very crucial, but um, in the study of, of uh, topological phases and uh, uh, classification of gap ground state phases and so on, it has proved to be really something essential. Um, because as I think Lucas uh, pointed out, you, can, you could say anions uh, are uh, the localized excitations that are not uh, produced from the vacuum by a local operator. So, so this, this notion of locality is, is inherent in, in all of these discussions. Okay, so then uh, uh, you're going to uh, define um, a Hamiltonian and a dynamics uh, sort of in the, in the usual way. And when um, we study uh, the thermodynamic limit of an interacting system, we will, we will do this on the level of the observables. Um, as Amanda pointed out, that's the, that's the way to go because you can't take, you, you can't define a priori or Hilbert space for the infinite system. So um, you work with local observables and you define their dynamics as a limit of dynamics generated by local Hamiltonians and local Hamiltonians associated with some finite set lambda can in principle um, be a sum of terms Tx uh, for any uh, subset X in lambda, you have a self adjoint operator, self adjoint observable in the local algebra AX, and you can add them up. But of course, for this limit to exist, we, we have to assume some, some decay. We, we don't need to go technical here, but uh, uh, it's one thing we can discuss in detail, but it quickly becomes kind of technical. You have to make some reasonable assumptions to be able to prove non trivial results. So, and this map is what, what is called an interaction. Um, it's actually the sum of all possible interactions that, that are present in the, in the system. Okay, and so um, uh, we have seen uh, different ways of uh, expressing decay of interactions. And um, one way to do it, and, and I, I just wrote this formula here because it's sort of a simple thing to do, uh, but there's many variations and depending on the context, you may have to modify that to be able to prove interesting theorems. So for instance, I could say, if I, if I fix uh, any, any pair uh, x, y in, in my lattice, and I sum all the interaction terms um, that touch on that pair, the subsystem at x and the subsystem at y, and I take the norm of the interaction term, all, all those, then that's bounded by some function that decays with the distance between x and y. So in, in z nu, I could just take L1 distance, the lattice distance, and whatever you like. Um, you could even uh, define, uh, and it's sometimes useful, Banach spaces of interactions by defining a norm in terms of this, like for instance, the smallest constant for which this holds, you could use as a, as a norm. And, uh, but there are many other ways to define uh, useful, useful norms depending on what the purpose is exactly. Okay, so um, you have a lattice, you have uh, all your spins associated uh, with the lattice side interactions and you have a dynamics. Now let's uh, talk about ground states. Um, so it has been done by, uh, by Amanda, by Yoshiko. Um, so let's, we can go very quickly over it. And um, uh, there's again here how you make the transition from ground states defined by eigenvectors belonging to the uh, minimum of the spectrum, the smallest eigenvalue of the local Hamiltonian H lambda if you take weak star limits of functionals that you define using these uh, uh, eigenvectors belonging to the ground state energy, um, you will get a state, a normalized linear functional uh, that satisfies uh, this condition. And so uh, the uh, limit of taking the commutator with the Hamiltonian H lambda, I'm going to call delta. And so I, I, don't, I don't include the I in the definition of, of, of this derivation. And so I don't have to take it out when I write the ground state condition. So that's why, for instance, compared to Yoshiko's definition, there is no imaginary I there. Because if you include it here, then you have to take it out there and it seems like useless writing. Okay, so Delta is commutated with the Hamilton. And this, and this of course will converge, uh, especially 
exactly because you have some kind of short phase interaction condition. Okay. And so in terms of this delta, this is my, uh, my, my ground state. The ground state will be time invariant. I've pointed out a couple of times also. And, and that uh, will mean that in the GNS representation, which I'll briefly review now, uh, the dynamics is implemented um, by a unitary group generated by a salvage on operator, which is the, the GNS Hamiltonian. And the reason, one reason immediately to be interested in the GNS Hamiltonian is that it actually gives you the spectrum of the infinite system. It's a solid node operator that has a spectrum, and that is the physical spectrum of excitation energies that you will find if you test with whatever experiment you have, uh, the bulk of your material described by the model that you're studying. So, so usually our, our, whole, our whole lab is, is an infant uh, lattice and I, I call it gamma. Um, and uh, uh, the GNS Hamiltonian is, is this salvage node operator that in the representation in the GNS representation just thought about this morning uh, generates the dynamics. And it's a non-negative salvage node operator. The GNS vector omega uh, is an eigenvector with eigenvalue zero. It represents the ground state. Um, and the other spectrum are the excitation energies of the system. And so we, we've been talking about uh, capped ground state phases all the time. So the gap in then that we are talking about is the gap in the spectrum of this operator. And so, so zero is the bottom of the spectrum. And so if there is an open interval, that has empty intersection, an interval of the form zero gamma that has an empty intersection of the spectrum, the savior, you have a gap uh, ground state. Now, if this uh, gamma is the full lattice, um, and so there is no boundary anymore, then that's what is physically referred to as the bulk gap. But I could do this whole process um, on a lattice that, well, it's not a full lattice, it's say a half space in, in, in Z nu, and then the spectrum of the GNS Hamiltonian um, uh, would correspond to the spectrum of edge excitations. Uh, because the Hilbert space, the GNS Hilbert space, on which the salvage joint operator is defined, is created from the ground state by acting with quasi local operators. And so if uh, uh, with this locality structure that we have and this algebra of quasi-local observables that we have. This means that if you, if you take a half space and you have your, uh, the boundary of your half space, uh, all uh, excitations that you create by such operators are at finite distance of, of the edge. And they may have a, a, a quite different spectrum of excitations, okay? So this, this is mathematically quite simple and, and very natural way to formulate exactly what this bulk spectrum is, the edge spectrum. And if um, yeah, I, I made fun of Emil a couple of days ago that is that he's sometimes very violent, but this is not uh, as a person, but he would like to do all kinds of things to systems and, and change their ladders and put other pieces on it and things like that. And so in principle, you can all fit this in, in this scheme. You just have to um, take a proper thermodynamic limit usually and uh, look at the GNS Hamiltonian that you get. And the system has been modified, and again, uh, the spectrum may look quite different, and uh, you can study excitation spectrum. Okay, so I didn't tell you anything new. Um, next slide, uh, still nothing new. I, I'm not here to tell you new things. Um, and so just here to remind you of the stage where, where we should discuss um, uh, correlated uh, systems and their uh, topological phases. So um, I would like to defend the point of view that um, you, you, one shouldn't forget what you actually wanted to study, or when, where it all started. Um, whether you're a physicist, a mathematician, a physicist, a physicist or a mathematician, um, the, this classification problem that, that we have focused so much on of, uh, uh, gap ground state phases 
is, is really about uh, saying interesting things about phase diagrams, ground state phase diagrams of physical models that have parameters. And uh, as you vary the parameters, uh, you can really see uh, sometimes uh, qualitative changes in the ground state behavior and, and um, uh, these different this regions in, in, the, in the phase diagram where the quality behavior is different are typically separated by quantum phase transitions that you can also study. And so let's, let's think about that. And so, so from that point of view, um, if you want to classify, okay, that means uh, you define an equivalence re uh, relation and then you want to describe the equivalence classes that you get. And so, um, well, we have to uh, we fix some system. So I like to say, let's fix the, the lattice and the Hilbert space of the component systems. But we, we consider some suitable Banach space of interactions that will define uh, the local and, and then the terminal limit uh, dynamics uh, for us. We have a certain family. It could be a small family. Maybe it depends only on one or two parameters. Or maybe we are interesting in, in, interested in a question that says all uh, interactions that are sufficiently local decay as, as in a certain way. And, and so um, it, it doesn't always matter much, but in some cases it may matter what you choose. And I, I, I denote that, that uh, set here by G. I think in the case of Yoshiko's talk, it was, um, there was a PUG, the, the set of all interactions with a unique uh, gapped ground state. That's what she looked at. And Anton had something similar. I, I don't remember the, what the notation was. So the equivalence relation that we, we uh, that I think is a very natural one. And that comes in fact from uh, a paper by uh, Chen uh, Guan Wen uh, more than 10 years ago, um, you know, a little bit turned into something that is uh, mathematically tractable. So if you have two such models, two such interactions in, in the class you want to consider, um, and say uh, we're talking about unique gap ground states, we could also generalize that, but just for concreteness, um, then uh, we call them equivalent if we can uh, see them as the endpoints of a differentiable curve of interactions valued in G, and it's differentiable with, you know, some suitable, with respect to some suitable norm that I've defined in this Banach space, and I'm not going to specify now. Um, it's it, that it has to be differentiable and not just continuous. Or and there's there's lots of things in between. It is a technical uh, thing that I don't want to discuss now. We could, but probably it doesn't make sense to discuss it uh, to, for the whole audience. Um, so, but you have a, a nice curve uh, with endpoints uh, t zero and t one. And along this curve, uh, there's a spectral gap that is uniformly bounded from below by some positive constant that will often be called gamma. So that is um, uh, a reasonable way to state rigorously what, uh, what is in this paper um, by, by Chen Guen Wen. Um, OK, so uh, these curves, so it, it if G, uh, you, or you take a, a small G, or you take just a subspace that is finite dimensional, um, I can take a basis, I can parameterize the interactions I'm interested in um, and look at uh, phase diagrams. So Amanda flashed a, a phase diagram and I, I will show it and show the, another one. Um, and so I would, to say, let's not forget that we want to study uh, these, these phase diagrams. At least from my point of view, that is sort of the really interesting physical question. And let's, uh, for instance, uh, look at the ON chains. Uh, these are spin chains. So, so I take something simple, one dimensional. It's a class that includes the AKLT model. So um, the AKLT model has an O3 symmetry. And um, uh, if you don't know it, this will be too brief an explanation, but it's a, it has a nearest neighbor interaction. So that means that the, the only non-zero interaction terms corresponds to sets of nearest neighbors in the, in the chain. And uh, the, the, the terms are, are just uh, translated copies of a fixed particular operator on two uh, spin one chains. So the, the Hilbert space is, is three dimensional um, at each side. And it, this is in fact a projection operator 
and it projects on the uh, subspace of spin two states in the tensor product of two spin modes. That is the AKLT model. And it's a model that has, um, uh, is in a non-trivial uh, symmetry protected topological phase. It's the, the example that we understand the best and that I think uh, started much of, of the concrete discussion of, of, uh, of this business. So, um, well, it's easy to generalize it. Um, we have a coefficient one half here, we have a coefficient uh, one six there. Of course, this constant uh, doesn't matter, uh, just uh, an offset of, of the energy. So we, we and also uh, an overall uh, positive factor in front of the Hamiltonian, we just set a different energy scale. Seeing that um, a reasonable way to parameterize uh, uh, interactions of this form where we, where we take arbitrary coefficients is by, uh, by an angle. So we say it's cosine phi, the Heisenberg interaction, and plus sine phi, the square of the Heisenberg interaction. And then we can look at the phase diagram as a function of phi. So I, I really have one parameter family of, of models that I'm looking at. So let's have a quick look at, at that phase diagram. Um, shouldn't spend too much time discussing it in detail, but um, uh, by putting some color, you, you at least see that, that it's interesting. Um, there are indeed different phases uh, with different behavior, and, and there's something to study here. So, so this is a, so it's really a, a circle, right, of models parameterized by this angle phi. And here is the AKLT model. And it's, uh, it's in this uh, non trivial SPT phase. It a, has a unique gap ground state, but it's not in the same equivalence class as the trivial ground state. If you impose symmetry, now this has a lot of symmetry. This is O3 symmetry. And it turns out that um, even a Z2 cross Z2 symmetry is, is enough to protect this uh, type of um, topo symmetry protected uh, topological phase. Um, so, but there's also other phases, and not all of them are gapped. So, for instance, there's a, a paramagnetic region where uh, you have gapless spectrum. And so, this you know, this week we are not really talking about those phases. Um, and then there is another gapped phase. It turns out, and uh, as it happens, it has dimerization. Actually, also breaks translation invariance. But it's only a small modification to adjust this whole business to uh, situations where we possibly have this kind of uh, discrete uh, symmetry breaking. Um, and then uh, uh, what has been known indeed for a very long time is kind of funny uh, in a way. Um, so concrete information has been available for quite some time and detailed information about these points that separate the different phases. Um, they're, they're, they're special by the fact that they are there, separating two different phases. Um, they're typically critical points. Um, and in, in this case, they are associated with exactly solvable uh, quantum spin chains. And they have been known for, for quite some time. And there's still open questions about them. People continue to study them. There's lots to say about them. But I'm sort of not going to do this now. So um, it gets even more interesting if, uh, if you generalize a little bit and say, well, uh, why O3, why not ON? And people have been very interested in ON uh, spin chains. And um, you, can, you can think of this as, a, again, a one parameter family. If uh, you make the Hilbert space at each side, uh, CN, so you have N dimensional spins with ON symmetry. And you also have a one parameter family of nearest neighbor interactions that respect the symmetry and you can write them uh, as a linear combination of uh, the swap operator of the state of two spins and a rank one projection on a maximally entangled state. I explained this here a little bit how this connects to the AKLT model. The AKLT model, you have to do a change of basis to see that it's on this point. But okay, this, this doesn't really matter here. Um, so, but then again, you can uh, look at a phase diagram. So now I have a U and a V, it's like cosine phi and sine, sine phi if you want. So we can put it on a, on a circle again, it's similar phase diagram. And it, it's well, very similar. And again, there are these uh, 
solvable points, like separate phases. And, and it's even more interesting in the sense that now the phase diagram really depends on whether n is even or, or odd. And maybe that doesn't surprise you, a different structure of the orthogonal group. Um, as it turns out, there is a, a, a special point where the ground states, where it, there's, the model is frustration free. The ground states are matrix product states. It's a unique matrix product state for odd n. So there's two dimerized matrix product states for even n. <clears throat> and so people have been interested in phase diagram for a long time. Uh, and, and again, so um, when we classify and when we uh, define invariants or indices to distinguish phases, uh, one interesting thing to do with them is to apply them to families like this and say something about the phase diagram. Okay, I, I said I, I was not going to talk very long, so I will, I will proceed. We don't have to discuss all, all the different things. But maybe I ex except to remark that um, in the context of what Amanda told us in, in the, uh, just in the last hour, these stability properties are sort of crucial to tell you that uh, in contrast to these, these very special points that separate phases and that um, have been known for a long time, uh, if you talk about these gap ground state phases, you're also always thinking about them as sort of regions in phase space, open regions. And so proving that they are open regions is what stability is about, right? So one thing is asking whether you can connect two models by a differentiable curve of interaction. Another thing is whether at least you can perturb in some way and you can, you can go with your curve a little bit in all directions and still be in the same phase. That's what stability is about. So you're not just studying in this classification problem special points. No, you're studying open regions in parameter space. That's what stability says. Okay, so then um, well, this slide maybe I don't really need. So this this is about symmetry protective uh, phases. Um, uh, Question? Yes. Uh, is it also clear that? Uh... Uh, the space of these gapped uh, states is uh, gapped phases is somehow uh, dense in the set of all interaction. No. Uh, well, of course, it, it would depend a little bit. Uh, I I don't know if you if you take a large enough space what what you get, but certainly uh, the typical phase diagrams that only have a few parameters, they may very very well have open regions where, where there is no gap, where you have continuous symmetry breaking, for instance, if, it, if, it, if it's a model with continuous symmetry, which implies that the gap closes or the gap, the gap may close for other reasons. Um, so it's not that everything is a gapped phase. Um, we have, not everything is an insulator, you know, we have conductors. So um, also for fermion systems, uh, it's not that there's only insulators. Is that, is that what you're asking about? Yes, thank you. Yeah. So yeah, open regions, but that doesn't mean uh, uh, they cover almost everything. They don't, they don't have to be dense. Okay, so, so when we are interested in, in these phase diagrams, so people uh, study uh, SPT phases and uh, indices or invariants for them and try to classify them. Uh, so we have heard several talks about that by, by uh, Yoshiko and, and by Anton. And um, so and they have solved this problem in, in this, a certain number of cases, right? Um, so I, I, I don't have to talk about it here. We can come back to it. Um, so if we've understood, for instance, now very rigorously that there is an index that singles out the AKLT phase as one where we have an untrivial uh, topological order that is symmetry protected. And we've clarified what symmetries that can be. Um, and there is this recent work, uh, um, first by Ogara, with uh, uh, two dimensional uh, SPD phases were characterized and uh, an invariant uh, was constructed. Uh, so a finite group G, uh, you have um, H3G and, and, and new one, and there is a, another work with essentially the same result that came a little later by uh, Sopanko. 
So, um, so that is uh, SPD phases. Um, but maybe even more interesting are the truly topologically ordered phases, the ones that give rise to anionic excitations and, and really exotic uh, uh, states of matter, quantum matter, that people have hopes uh, will be useful in, in, in technological applications, or you can just study because it's so fascinating. Um, so the question of stability is, is important in, in general. And um, I, I just want to briefly mention, we, we don't have to discuss uh, all these different papers here, but it is a, a remarkable point that there are general results about stability. So given a model for which you know there is a gap, if you perturb it a little bit, there will still be gap. Um, but the condition that you um, almost always need is that it's frustration free. So the, gen the general results um, that are out there that cover a lot of cases have this frustration free assumption in them. Um, not all these, it's not known uh, that there is a frustration free point, for instance, in the dimerized phase here. Um, it's certainly suspected that you can uh, find other models that sort of are in other dimensions of our phase diagram where, that, that are in the same phase as this dimerized phase and that are frustration free, but, but these are definitely not frustration free. And so proving stability for them um, has proved a little bit more difficult. So there are some special results, there's some recent results that we got specifically for these OAN models in this uh, preprint we're interested in, but I'm not going to talk about that. Okay, so um, what can you get from um, uh, this equivalence by a, a differentiable path of interpolating interactions, interpolating model? And so it's, it's sort of come, a, come up a, a couple of times, but I thought maybe it would be nice to sort of highlight it and, and to see where sort of for instance, the LGAs that Anton was talking about, where it, where it really comes from. So, um, so let's sort of simplify our notation a little bit. And, and, and suppose we, we have a, a curve of interactions that I can, I can write like this. So um, you, can, you can resum interactions and, sometimes, and present the, the Hamiltonian in, in different ways. And, and one may be more convenient than, than the other. Um, and I'm mostly looking for simple formulas and <laughs> for the slide here. Um, there's different ways of doing it. Um, but suppose you have something of this form where these h x's are, are almost local uh, Hamiltonians, uh, terms in the Hamiltonian, you have to think of them that they are sort of concentrated around the side x of your lattice gamma. And, and suppose you have a curve uh, of gap models that is described like that. And, um, well, here it's kind of here you see immediately it's kind of interesting if if this curve is differentiable because then I can introduce uh, this quantity here so I, I can take the derivative of these interaction terms and uh, subject them to this integral operator I uh, was um, introduced by by Hastings and Hastings when in various forms and Hastings called it a quasi adiabatic continuation or quasi adiabatic evolution um, and the, the uniform bound on the gap that you have for the curve enters as a parameter in this integral operator. And I'm not going to give you the details, but so it's a, it's a fast decaying function. And it's the decay rate depends on the gap in a certain way. And I don't have to give you all the formulas. And then if you, uh, and then of course, uh, if you sum this up, you can, you can get a, a new Hamiltonian. And it turns out that the dynamics generated by this Hamiltonian where S is interpreted as some fictitious time, um, uh, creates these automorphisms that Amanda used, for instance, uh, to transform the Hamiltonian by transformation so that you can uh, prove a relative form bound. The relative form bounds are not always available. They're not generic. Um, but if you're clever and you um, uh, got this crazy adiabatic evolutions, then, then you, you can map a lot of uh, systems and basically generic perturbations of relatively bounded plots. 
if you have the translation completion. Okay, so um, and if uh, you use Lee province and bounds and the locality properties, uh, the assumption of the decay of the interactions that they are sufficiently short range, you can take the thermodynamic limit of these of this flow and define uh, automorphisms that um, are strongly continuous, satisfy the problems and bound, which means that they have nice quasi locality properties, just like uh, the LGAs, the locally generated automorphisms that Anton and Kapustin was introducing. And, and they will actually uh, for, do for you uh, the wonderful job of following that ground state along the differentiable curve of interactions that you have. So the ground state at parameter S is obtained as the ground state at say zero, uh, composed with one of these automorphisms. And so the ground states flow nicely also from one to the other. And then it makes sort of sense that uh, indeed, um, if you start with a gap model and you can prove uh, that the gap remains open, uh, all the qualitative properties that you associate with a gap phase will, um, will be left invariant because you have that nice uh, uh, quasi local automorphism that interpolates bet between the states. Yeah. And in fact, uh, it's also the conversely, um, this is uh, physically well motivated, but it's also universal in a way. So if you have uh, automorphism generated by almost local interactions, such as the LGAs, that uh, connect uh, to uh, gapped uh, ground states. And in fact, you can use them to uh, define a family of Hamiltonians for which these gap are the ground states. So, so this is really the same thing. Um, and now you can, uh, so this has been very useful in studying symmetry protected topological phases, but you could use it to study symmetry enhanced topological phases. And, um, long range entangled uh, situations where there are still uh, many open questions. So I wanted to, before we sort of start the discussion and uh, have some topics to propose, uh, I wanted to sort of uh, uh, remind ourselves where, where, what we're studying and why we are studying it. I mean, you, you can have your own motivations, of course. I'm not saying that uh, your motivations are no good if they don't come from the physical phase diagrams that the physicists, the condensed matter physicists tell us to look at. I'm not saying that. Um, but it is a, a useful uh, thing to keep in mind, in my view. Okay, so I've talked long enough. So there's some topics we could discuss and, and I'd be very happy to, to add a few. So keep, start thinking about what I should add to this, to this list. So, uh, so this is more like a sort of a slogan and sort of maybe a statement. So I, I, I wanted us not to forget that classifying gap phases is, is about ground state phase diagrams and saying interesting things about them. Um, there are some interesting questions about uh, long range entangled phases. Um, they uh, uh, lead to uh, anions. Um, and uh, anions are uh, localized excitations. And so it's, it's kind of interesting that um, the, 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 there is, they are, but it's also what the, in quantum field theory, what we believe that everything is really present in, in the vacuum. I mean, it's, the vacuum contains all secrets. You may not, you know, to do an experiment, you may have to go out of the vacuum and prod it with a little energy, but it's all in there, right? And so there is this uh, notion of topological entropy, uh, topological entanglement entropy that um, uh, is, is sort of an intriguing quantity that people have used to detect long-range entanglement. Um, and it's related to uh, something that is a basic property of uh, the uh, category of anions that you have that describe the excitations of the system to, due to the quantum dimension. Well, I think it's an interesting topic. I don't know whether I have personally a lot new to say about this, but um, that would be good to discuss. Um, LTQ is an important condition that, that, that always remains a little bit mis mysterious until you have really thought about it for a good while. Um, 
So how important is it for stability and, and um, uh, how does it generalize? It's something we could discuss. Um, in the sole classification problem of um, to gap topological phases, you often see uh, the use of stabilization, which I haven't talked about. And there are certainly good uh, reasons to do that. And so I would like to, uh, I would be very happy to learn what, what people think about it. What's the right way? You know, Why do we need to do it as a mathematical need? Um, and what is the right way of doing it? So these are sort of questions I had after listening to the talks uh, this week, but maybe you have questions. And I see there's hands up. So um, maybe uh, Sven is at the top. So I assume he was first. Um, Sven. I don't think I was first. I think uh, Blaje was before me. Oh. OK. Blaje Ruba, you were first, Sven says. Uh, yes, so I, I wanted to follow up on the question that I asked earlier. So. Uh, the example, uh, the counter example to my question that you gave with the ferromagnets uh, uh, involves symmetry and spontaneous breaking. So in some sense, uh, it is already uh, somehow contained uh, in some uh, lower dimensional uh, uh, subspace in the set of all interactions. So you mean because of the symmetry? Uh, yes, so my question was rather, uh, uh, because my question actually doesn't make sense if we don't say what is the space of right. interactions that that, right. that that we are considering. But somehow I'm trying to think about all interactions uh, suitably nice if, if that makes sense without any symmetries. And then uh, do we know anything about that? Whether are there open regions? Uh, because we at least know that there are open regions with, with a gap, right? Uh, uh, right. What do we think about this? Okay, well, you'll see. Maybe maybe people have, have ideas about this. It would be nice to discuss. Yeah, an interesting question. Who, so who was next? Uh, Sven, it must be you. Um, yes, so, it, you know, it's about the, again, the definition of, um, of phases. So the definition you gave, and that of course I like, uh, I like much, is, is based on this continuous path. But we've also seen, you know, I mean, how should I say? You can also map lo you know, states locally to other states by um, cellular automaton. Mm -hmm. And so is that also something to be considered in the classification of, of phases? And sh should we allow for states to be mapped to each other by cellular automata? And it, you know, would that give us more uh, you know, or different phases? And, and in particular, you would also ask about finite that quantum circuits, I guess. Uh, yes. Um, okay. I'll put question marks. Okay. I'm just collecting questions. So I, I was so hoping we can find some answers too. But <laughs> very good. Yeah. Um, yeah. So so clearly, um, how you set up your equivalence relation. Um, it, it, we sort of believe that it, that it doesn't matter much. So we have the freedom to, to do what suits us, uh, what's convenient, and, and hopefully we find the same answers all the time. But maybe this is not always true. It's a good question. Um, In fact, another question which is related to this one is that, is that is whether, I mean, we define here something in terms of an equivalence relation, but quite often people like to think of somehow this set of states as, as being a topological space, having a nice topology, but we haven't defined a topology on that space either. Oh, so I, I think Yoshiko defined a very nice topology in her. She, she does. I mean, that's one. In, 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 yeah. On this uh, interaction phase. So we do have the. Oh, no, no. Yes. Oh, no, no, no. That's a different question. Yes. I mean, that, that's okay. That's enough, a nice Banach space. But I'm now talking about the topology on the set of states. You know that. Um, it's a it's a fair question, and but um, yeah, let let let's think about what what would make sense. It's probably easy to come up with things that don't make sense. But <laughs> <laughs> okay, while well, we are still collecting questions, uh, Daniel, you have a question too. Uh, oh yeah, Daniel. Yes, thank you. I have some. Uh, technical questions, some basic technical questions, but the things that were on the slides. Um, so when you have this 
uh, omega s equals omega naught composed with alpha s. Uh, nice. Also, this is related to the topology on the state space. Well, it's clear that this omega s is weak star continuous because alpha s is strongly continuous. But would you also expect omega s to be norm continuous in s? Oh, no, def no, definitely not. OK. I don't know. Uh, that would be very exceptional, I think. Oh, OK. Um, and I have uh, one other question. No, I mean, uh, in fact, uh, generically, I expect that the norm difference between omega s and omega s prime is two whenever s is different from s prime. OK, that's, that's what I thought. Um, uh, so my other question is, if you have um, not a not a unique ground state, but multiple ground states, then how do you talk about the the gap? Um, because it depends on the GNS, or I don't know, maybe it doesn't depend on the GNS representation um, of the ground state that you choose. Okay, it's a it's it's a good question. No, it could depend. Um, um, so maybe we can discuss various cases. I mean, there are some things we know and many things we don't know. Um, Emil, you, you wanted to yes, ask uh, something to, yeah? When we, when we set up the problem right from the beginning, deciding on the degrees of freedom per site, uh, we always have to make an approximation. I mean, we always work with effective models. So this, the space of these local degrees of freedom, it's actually uh, not fixed. Uh, and in non-interacting case, we fix that problem very simply. We tensor with the, with the compact operators and we call that stabilization. But here, it seems that in, uh, increasing the degrees of freedom per, per site will change the whole problem drastically. For example, going from spin uh, one half to spin one and then spin three and uh, so on. Uh, however, if you work with, uh, let's say, a simple electronic system, then uh, the question is, okay, you include, do you include in your analysis the S orbitals? Do you include also the P orbitals? Do you include the D orbitals? Mm -hmm. At some point you stop because you say they are chem chemically inert, but nevertheless, you have to uh, remind yourself that there are uh, a lot of degrees of freedom for which uh, which are just thrown thrown away. Um, well, good question. I, I mean, I, I could say, I mean, uh, make sure to talk to get your model from a good physicist, but um, so that what they've thrown out was indeed not important. Um, so, but anyway, it's it's a good question whether you can prove some kind of robustness uh, in what that would take. Uh, Right, I, I, I'm guessing. Not robustness, but uh, at least this classification seems to be stable against some sort of a tensor, mm -hmm. tensor product with something. Well, I, I'd be happy to learn about that, how, you, how to set it up. Yeah. Um, well, John, um, I think you were oh, next. Hello. Yes. Um, so my question is somewhat related to the uh, ground state degeneracy question earlier on, but uh, perhaps um, might be even the, the, the problem I'm trying to ask might be even more serious. Namely, uh, these days, uh, when people study topological insulators, they are start off as being distinguished, uh, even if you work within this one particle Hamiltonians, uh, they're distinguished amongst the gap one particle Hamiltonians by uh, the fact that you have these uh, uh, gapless uh, H states, or in, in fact, uh, gap filling even. So there's no possibility of redefining the Fermi energy. To lie inside some energy gap of uh, 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 of the topolog topological insulator uh, inhabiting, say, a half space. Um, so my, the question is, what is the analog uh, in in the quantum spin systems when you have such a, uh, a anomalous H spectrum? So anomalous in the sense that there is absolutely no gap at all. And is, there, is there any hope to uh, to to discuss this sort of system? Because this sort of uh, absence of a Gap is sometimes in quantum field theory, uh, I guess, casually uh, said to be anomalies, for example, and they are handled in different ways. Well, I, I, there may be multiple questions you're asking, but we, we, can, we can see maybe 
Yeah, it was basically the something. problem of absence of a cap. <laughs> yes. Um, okay. Yeah. Um, Michael. Yeah. So this might be a naive question, but I'm curious as to whether there are more quantum information theoretic quantities that we can use to compute which of these, uh, for example, SPT phases we're living in, um, rather than looking at this index. So if I run into a phase in the wild, is there something resembling mutual information with respect to some state or something like this that I can actually sit down and calculate um, rather than having to go to this cohomology theory? Maybe you mean even observe? Or observed, yeah. <laughs> well, let's see what, it's an interesting question. Let's see what people say about that. Okay. My slide is full, huh? So I think we, we have to start uh, doing answers. Uh, is there still a question? Um, Lise, you have a question? Oh, yeah. Yes, actually, I want to follow up to some things that were said like a minute ago. So, so, so we know already that uh, in some low dimensions there are some rigorous invariants. Uh, uh, do we also expect to have something like boundary, bulk boundary correspondence in this setting, or is anything known in this direction? And I'm sure that also physicists have done like computer simulations before. And uh, uh, so perhaps there are some conjectures or observations. Yeah, thanks. Uh, good question. So maybe um, we should um, organize ourselves uh, uh, a little bit. So I, I think we should give priority to the questions you, you have raised, not, not the ones I brought. Um, um, so well, is there anything known about? I'm, I'm not sure. Uh, not sure. This first question that you put here, classify gap phases is about ground state phase diagrams. OK, Emil, you want to talk about that? Good. Well, uh, yeah. I'm happy this to talk about it. The phase diagram. Maybe I should stop sharing so we can sort of see. No, uh, no, 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 please. No? please uh, close no. we, we can look at a phase diagram that you put in a few slides. Uh, however, if we, if we look uh, now in the context of this classification, we see that this uh, phase diagram is only over one parameter phi, while this the space of this phase diagram will blossom to this Banach algebra, a Banach space that uh, we were mentioning. So are we talking about this, the phase diagram in this huge uh, parameter space, which is the entire yeah. Banach space? Um, I mean, you know, mathematically, we, we, there's no restriction to what you can look at, but um, um, if you have interesting things to say for uh, a general and ge generally infinite dimensional Banach space of models of interactions, um, I mean, there are implications for sections, right? Um, so then if, uh, if, if there's a physical situation where there is a couple of parameters, and it's true, this is you know, just one maybe um, doesn't do justice to Oh, so I, I, and, okay. and in particular, uh, this okay. here, I, they all have O3 symmetry. I should also include some, if you want to see what happens if you re relax the symmetry and, and include the trivial phase. But uh, let, 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 yeah, let's say we keep the symmetry, but we include second nearest neighbor, third near neighbor. Mm -hmm. yes. uh, we'll be able to connect these different phases shown here in this diagram or not. But, but, but isn't that exactly the interest of no. having these indices right. such as Dogato's index that tells us precisely we can, you can add as many dimensions to this phase diagram as you want. If you want to go from yellow to pink, you will have to change the value of the index. And so you can't do this. So, so we, we, have know, to close the gap. We, know, we know the index of these incommensurated phases. I, that looks... They're, they're also gapless. Uh-huh. As far okay. as we know. They're not known. They're not understood very well, but they're, they're supposed to be gapless. So, so maybe I, I should uh, 
So, so I, I agree if these are characterized by different of these indices that were defined, but we, we learned that these indices might not be complete. So mm -hmm. they are... Uh... Well, there's two things, right? There's, 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 there's two questions. So the indices may, may not be complete. Um, what, the, what exactly does that mean, right? And that's where, where also the question of stabilization comes in, I think. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, so, so being... you, may, you may have um, disconnected regions that are nevertheless, in all respects, representatives of the same topological phase, same, same type of topological order. There's nothing that prevents that from happening. And so, so in this sense, um, yeah, so depending on how we look at it, and that, for that, it's important, of course, to use a Banach space of interactions that is large enough because you could artificially create islands by cutting out certain interactions, right? You, you don't really want to do that. Especially not if you're asking whether you have a complete index, you, you would not want to do that. Um, yeah. But in the direction where you can, uh, calculate um, an invariant in, 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 in two points and you find a different value, then, then you can apply it to whatever space of interactions that, you know, at least where it can be, where it can be calculated, where it can be well-defined, right? I mean, there's always some condition so that um, the invariant is well-defined. But if it is, then you will, you will know that there will be a quantum phase transition in any interpolation from one model to the other, right? So if... Uh... We could, we could very well say that we are looking for the connected components of a topological state because that's what we are using, yes. maybe with an action of a group. And if you look in the literature, what that can be is can be whatever you want. So it could be huge. So a few indices will, it's doubtful that it will, it will can characterize such a, such a space. However, there is this condition about the uniformity of the gap, uh, which says that it's not really any, any continuous path will do it. We, we still have to check this condition. And I was wondering if that condition is redundant or not. It's almost uh, uh, implying that the, the gap might in fact not be continuous of even if we vary this parameter continuously. Okay, so, um, well, again, there's a different question. So the, the continuity of the gap is not known, obviously. Well, in general, it's not known, but even sort of uh, in, in reasonable settings. I mean, we, so we don't ask that the gap is continuous. Okay, we ask that it has a unicorn lower bound, right? Um, we don't really care if it jumps, as long as it doesn't touch zero. And usually it jumps and... Uh... And it so can jump. Not, I mean, it's certainly, well, it certainly, there are situations, not, it's, there are unstable models also. We have a gap that is really, it's like a model that is kind of a, is not part of an open region, it's, it's an isolated point. Um, so stability is not universal. I mean, that's right. Um, so, so in other words, it, it, it better be generic and we want it to prove in as many situations as possible, but um, it's not universal. Okay, so it's the condition is not redundant because if it was continuous, then we knew there will be a lower bound. Yeah, no, we don't. We don't know that. I mean, once you take the thermodynamic limit, so it means um, we are not really looking at the connecting components, but there is one more condition on this uh, uh, on these paths. So it's not a pure topological question. It's uh, that's uh, that that's a good point, I think, Emil. I mean, it's not clear it's a pure topological question because um, in fact this was a little bit my question before, right? It's, it's, yeah. Can you make this classification by just talking about states without you know without having to go to the automorphisms and, and invoking a gap? So you know, and so some people definitely believe that or, or, or want to work to in that direction. Um, and for instance, you can use the, the finite that uh, circuits and and so on. Um, but um, well, you you need to you know why exactly finite? You know, 
uh, maybe maybe you have to close the the operation of uh, the space of circuits that you consider in some way and uh, impose some condition on them. Uh, I don't know. Um, things people who have worked with them a lot maybe can sort of say what what the current thinking is. Uh, I'd be happy to learn about it. Is there anybody? I wanted to follow up what was just asked. Uh, so one question and one remark. So the question is uh, whether these uh, relatively recent results about stability of the uh, of the gap uh, uh, tell us some, something about uh, about this necessity of the are they too, too weak to conclude that along differentiable curves we will have uh, uniformly uh, well gap bounded uniformly for below and 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 the remark is that uh, about this about these connected components is that well i would think that uh, perhaps if the whole space also contains gapless interactions which lead to gapless uh, 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 phases and somehow you can you can reach them in, in finite time right uh, they yes. are not infinitely far away so perhaps yes. we should restrict to the smaller space of gapped phases and then you need some finer topology so that so that the gapless phases are actually infinitely far away and maybe then we 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 would have all the continuity that it is needed so of course that's just a speculation well that's an interesting idea so um it's certainly true that um so if you have a a, a, a sufficiently local um quasi local automorphism that connects some model say in, in a trivial phase with a, a trivial a gap Hamiltonian then uh, yes the ground states that you obtain by uh, by composing will be gap ground states of a sufficiently short range interaction mm -hmm. but it's indeed the case that um, so if if um, uh, there's, there's a connection between the size of the gap and uh, the decay of this interaction. Um, so the, the extent of the interaction range. And so there's probably a way to normalize it that um, may, maybe that would lead to some, some kind of uh, topology where uh, the, the gapless points in, in fact uh, recede to infinity. Okay. I, I, it, it's possible. Um, Oh, okay. Yeah, so if so, this relation here, if alpha s is uh, has uh, this um, Lee Robinson, a good Lee Robinson bound, and you use it only for a finite time, uh, when you apply it, or, you, or it's inverse, I suppose, uh, to the Hamiltonian for which h0 is a gap ground state, you will get a Hamiltonian for which it's omega s is a gap ground state. Um, it's a unitary transformation. So the only question is whether when you apply it to the Hamiltonian, whether you stay within the class of Hamiltonians you want to consider. I mean, it, naively, right? I mean, it's, um, it, it's not difficult to show that also for the infinite system, the gap inequality is preserved by this action. Um, um, can I ask a Quick question and or sort of remark on this point because you know Anton and uh, Nikita and others have been looking at these Kitaev conjectures about characterizing the homotopy type of this space of gapped ground states, provided that topology can be made sense of. Um, and in particular, right? I mean, you don't just want to necessarily consider just the connected components, you also want to try and consider. Um, uh, higher homotopy groups. So, if, for mm -hmm. example, in 1D, there should be expected to be a um, pi 3, I think. Um, and as far as I can tell, anyway, there's nothing stopping you from at least applying some of this quasi local machinery to not just the interval, right, but for um, other topological spaces and sort of potentially more, more, more general types of paths. But 
I mean, I'm far from an expert, so I just wanted to ask about this point. It's an interesting question. I, I probably I don't have anything illuminating to say at, at this moment. I, I don't think that it could be something worthwhile looking into. Um, so, yeah, well, should it be classification of states uh, regardless of Hamiltonians? Sounds like Emil was wondering whether that, that would be more reasonable. Uh, I think Sven, Sven was wondering. Sven is not committing, you know, we don't know what he really thinks. He just, <laughs> I'm, just I, I, I'm asking questions. <laughs> because I, I, I for sure would like to, to involve the, the Hamiltonians and the algebra that these Hamiltonians, if there is one, um, define. But I mean, I mean, it all depends on wh with whom you're talking to, right? It's true that uh, for the you know, this community here in this conference, the Hamiltonians play a, centrum, a central role. Um, but but if you talk to a, a quantum information theorist, for example, they will completely forget the Hamiltonians, mm -hmm. and they'll say there's only states. Uh, in fact, for example, they you know they, they think of uh, SPT phases as as phases of of constant computational power, whatever that means. Mm -hmm. And so they really don't care about Hamiltonians. They really think of, of only having states and, 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 and classifying, you know, their, whatever that means, the, the structure of entanglement or what is like, again, computational power. With. So, so I don't know, I, I, I tend to, I tend also to, to kind of like that point of view, it, you know, it's, it's a point of view that requires kind of less ingredients. At least, uh, so it appears. Uh, I mean, they, yes. they find that circuits, that they are unitaries. And um, uh, if you want these unitaries to act, you have to turn on time, you know? And that means you have to have a Hamiltonian that will, that will do this. I and mean, it's the only way that it can possibly happen, right? Mm -hmm. And so the, at some point this question, whether within the space of reasonable, available, controllable, constructible Hamiltonian devices, this thing is available. Otherwise it's also in their uh, universe, I think, um, uh, use, useless. Yeah. But th does anyone know more about the, this um, uh, topology that uh, Chris brought up uh, on the, Space of states. Uh, I, I, I don't. I don't know it. I must say, I don't know exactly what the conjecture is that uh, Kitai is allowed to follow. From. I mean, I'm not entirely sure if this topology has been completely rigorously defined mm -hmm. yet. I mean, it, people seem to have a rough idea what they expect it to be. Right? Okay. Somehow. The, you know, you need to translate these these conditions about the interaction just purely into the states, which is not necessarily an easy thing, right? But, you know, it clearly can't just be the state space uh, topology or anything like that. You really have to use the fact that you're really only dealing with gapped ground states and some kind of, yeah, LGA path between them. But I don't think Anton's here, but he might um, be able to say more, but. See if you've already, Figured out what a what a path is. Uh, as long as you can also figure out what a smooth triangles with the states are, and so on, you have a simplicial set, and that's all you need for these conjectures, which are just about homotopy types anyway. Okay, that's so. I mean, from a mathematical point of view, it's a bit of a red herring to actually topologize the space of states if you're only doing homotopy theory. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, that, an interesting remark. I mean, it is clear that Hamiltonians, of course, I mean, any given particular Hamiltonian has, has too much information, too much detail, it specifies uh, all kinds of things about the spectrum. You, you see this, you know, in the treatments where, where you flatten the, the spectrum. And, and of course, uh, you, don't, you don't need uh, to know exactly what the Hamiltonian does in the whole space of, of states. Um, that's, that's clear. Um, and isn't it the case that if you fix the ground state, there's a contractible family of Hamiltonians of which 
the ground state could be the ground state, in which case, again, from the point of view of, of homotopy theory, it really wouldn't matter whether you work upstairs with the Hamiltonian or downstairs with the, just the ground state. But is this true, uh, really? I mean, uh, somehow I imagine the space of Hamiltonians to be uh, like, uh, uh, well, some uh, uh, space over the space of, of states. Uh, and then it could be somehow a non-trivial bundle if... Uh, of well, I think, the, I mean, what can happen is that there's just nothing above a given state and that, that's a problem. But otherwise, if the fibers of this bundle uh, are just contractible spaces, I mean, they're affine spaces, uh, there's not going to be any difference between the topology upstairs and downstairs, except for this issue of existence. Is there a Hamiltonian attached to a given state? So, yeah, I mean, that there would always have to be some kind of principle that um, limits states to those that are sort of physically reasonable, but whatever that exactly means. And, and so with respect to some measure, they have to have finite energy or finite energy density or locally normal. And then there's, there's different properties you can think of that certainly not all states have. Um, and you know, the, the full uh, state space of, of an infinite system is, is, is something enormous. Um, so there has to be some principle when you select a reasonable um, states. And so like in, like in uh, you know, axiomatic quantum field theory, they will have some principles that select the representation of the algebra of observables they, they, they want to look at, not just all representations, because that is just um, uh, a huge class with, with lots of things that have no known connection to <laughs> physical phenomena. Um, but uh, apart from that, yeah, I, I think um, it, it, um, it certainly doesn't require a specific Hamiltonian. I, mean, I, I sort of agree with that. Um, I, Nigel, if I may, uh, what maybe you know what K theory can say about the state space? Uh, state space. Um, K theory is not very good at in talking about individual irreducible representations. I, I assume you, you're meaning you have an algebra, you want to study its states, and you want and and study the K-theory of the algebra to say something about the states. If that's yeah. the case, then there's a sort of a mismatch because K-theory is all about uh, projective modules, which are like families of irreducible modules, not, not individual irreducible modules. So if, you, if you're talking about topological K-theory, it's not, not uh, simple to answer that question. In algebraic contexts, it's different. You can you can uh, reconcile the K-theory made out of irreducible modules with or finitely generated modules or something with the K-theory made out of uh, projective modules. But that's a different world, I think, than the world we're in. Uh -huh. Maybe a comment about these things is just that I don't necessarily think that the choices, well, you know, the, the question about uh, the perspective of Hamiltonians versus um, topology on interactions versus topology on states and whatnot. Like, I think there should be a, some amount of flexibility in terms of what you're really trying to do might actually change the choices that you make. Um, because you're probably motivated by different questions, for example. I'm, I mean, just as a simple example, right? If you just restrict to these quasi-free states on the car algebra, you can allow for things that close the ground state gap and all this other kind of stuff. Okay, it doesn't close it particularly badly, but it still closes it, but you can still um, define topological type quantities there, which are still have useful properties. Um, but it's just a different thing now because you're working in a different sort of set of allowed perturbations and paths. And as a result, it also probably answers different physically motivated questions. 
Um, so I don't know if the idea that every that every single choice has to converge to the same thing is always going to be the case, right? I mean, another example that comes to my head is if you just consider 1D bosonic systems um, or just matrix product states, if you allow for stacking, then in some sense there's only one. But if you restrict um, what you can do with these states, I think it's an old paper of Sven and Yoshiko that uh, you can get a more refined um, sort of invariant uh, under C1 paths of um, interactions. And this still could be useful. It's just, I mean, I guess ideally you probably have, there should be a physicist to tell you what's a good thing to do and what's a bad thing to do. But, you know, you can also be motivated by some other um, reasons as well, where you have a, you have a particular choice in mind in terms of what am I allowed, um, paths or perturbations, and um, it may not necessarily be the same as a, um, another choice. Yes, I mean, at the time in that, uh, in that paper with Yoshiko, we, we had something slightly different in mind because what we're talking about now is mostly, you know, classifying bulk states or really states in the, in the infinite volume limit without an edge. Well, there we, we had the idea that, you know, you, don't, you should not only consider the bulk, so in one, you just have the infinite chain, but also the two possible half infinite chains. And so, of course, then you have additional degrees of freedom of how, you know, what happens at the edge. And therefore, that, that gives you a kind of a finer classification. Um, I think somehow people have not been too interested in that, uh, probably because just classifying the bulk is, is you know, complicated enough. Um, but, but, but of course, I agree. I mean, it's, uh, you know, it's your choice. You could, you could add into your choice that you're not only looking at you know, infinite systems, but also all possible you know, half infinite systems and, and so on. In one dimension, this is quite limited. In two dimensions, there's even more. So yes. So Sven, yeah, I mean, connection to this and a connection to the question about bulk edge correspondence. Yes. So the, are you suggesting that um, a perfect correspondence between edge and bulk is, is in general not going to be the case? I mean, because for instance, uh, if you're serious about classifying what happens at the edges in, in spin chains, um, then you find a much refi more refined classification. Than, what you have for the bulk. Yes, absolutely. In fact, uh, that's absolutely right. The AKLT, I mean, it all, it all depends, right? I mean, if you, if you want to take symmetry into, into consideration or not, but the AKLT state, without if you don't consider symmetry, it's in the trivial phase, uh, but it has interesting edge states. And so, you know, from that point of view, it sits in the same phase as the purely boring as Lukash would say, and the boring product state in the bulk, but it's not if you if you consider edges, if you consider edges as well. Uh, so no, I think you know to come back to this bulk edge correspondence. I think this is e even in the physics community not really clear when you should expect bulk edge correspondence and when you shouldn't. I mean, I I'm, I'm essentially just uh, you know restating things I've heard. I don't really know this. But I think some in some of these uh, topological phases, you should expect bulk edge correspondence, and some you shouldn't. And I and I, I don't know when, but and of course it's interesting to to know when when it exists. For instance, when, yeah, um, right. And um, so it's definitely something interesting trying to prove. But maybe you should not be too ambitious. I mean, it's not a universal truth. <laughs> Indeed. Yeah. If you do if you do an exercise and you work with one particle and then you work with two particles and you put an edge, you will find out that uh, strong topological in insulators become weak topological insulators. So it all already breaks down when you go from one particle to two particles. So what do you mean by it become a, a strong insulator become, becomes a weak insulator? Uh, so the invariant which uh, uh, you had for one particle now become a weak, weak weak invariant, it doesn't involve all the, the dimensions. Mm -hmm. 
Mm. So, uh, so then uh, that's why it's better to talk about bulk defect correspondence because ah. it's the defect. So then oh, there he is again. Very good. You just, pass, you just pass to anions, which is again a sort of a bulk boundary stuff. Bulk defect, I, I will say. Mm -hmm. So uh, I wanted to uh, actually uh, ask something about something Sven said. So, so you said you said that uh, in AKLT, uh, if you throw away the symmetry, uh, then the system is trivial essentially, but it has edge states. But isn't it the case that the edge states are actually protected by the symmetry? So from the point of view of the uh, uh, of the classification without symmetries, these edge states are just an accident, aren't they? You can just decouple them by some local perturbation at the boundary. So, uh, so I mean, uh, I think it is all, uh, it, it, it is, it is, uh, it is expected that you will have exceptional systems which can have as many accidental edge states as, as you wish, but, uh, but then you can just uh, uh, sort of gut them away by, and, so is that correct? Do you agree? Yeah, I think I agree with you. But you see, I mean, again, it's, it's only a question of definitions. If you say, you know, part of my definition is that, that I, I do not only consider state, but I consider, I think, uh, you know, I, I consider the set of ground states of a system and I, and I want to smoothly deform this set. Then, of course, if you take the AKLT, you, you start, your starting point is the AKLT state. And you consider not only the bulk but also uh, half systems. Then, okay, this is a two-dimensional, this is a two-dimensional state, and you cannot deform that smoothly to a one-dimensional uh, space, right? So it's a bit of a, it's a bit of the question of your de of the definition. So, so what what could be true still uh, is that you can you can have uh, inequality. Uh, like uh, the the invariant could tell you the bulk invariant could tell you that you can have you will have at least some number of edge states and at some exceptional points this uh, inequality may not be saturated there may be more right. but yes yeah I think I agree there are some comments in the chat. Um... I, I, I don't know whether I can deal with two channels at, at, at <laughs> once, but uh, um, I, I will read them and, and, may, and maybe people can 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 elaborate. So um, Michael is, is commenting on to Sven about um, the recent classification paper uh, about about the one D systems, uh, Kapustin Sopenko Yang. I mean, it is an equivalence relation of states. Um, sure, but it's uh, okay. Okay, yes, but it's. Uh, implicit in there that you can it's the same equivalence relation that you would get if you right. would consider curves of interactions right yes. and so there is kind of you can't really tell the difference so. Mm -hmm. um, so i don't know whether that's an example of where you could say that you don't need the hamiltonians um, and then chris um or chris maybe um Wants to make his comment. Uh, I, mean, I, I don't know if there's anything much that at least I can add to it anyway, apart from, uh, you know, I have attended some lectures by Yuji Tashikawa, who uh, does work on invertible field theories. And he was saying, uh, you know, when you try and apply these things to SBT phases and related systems, then, you know, you have your gap system, which should be in an. Um, which one expects to somehow be related to a you know unitary invertible TQFT, and when you try and look at the edge theory, then you know this should somehow be a gapless thing. But what it is a gapless field theory should essentially be a conformal field theory. But yeah, I mean the only example that I'm aware of um, where I think this has been mathematically made clear is the Ising 2D guy, where they look at the phase transition and it's very, very hard analysis to show that in the scaling limit, um, you get a CFT, but... Yes, I mean, but, but I mean, is that statement somehow, you know, if you just live in the world of TQFT, you know, you don't care about whether 
they really represent a, a lattice system and some scaling limit. So is this a statement that is, uh, you know, a theorem in, in TQFT? Well, I mean, I don't know how you would represent a C, uh, particularly a conformal field theory on uh, in, a, in a lattice system, right? I mean, people are, I think they are trying to, yes. uh, you know, these level one models and um, a state some type of construction, say at least give you a way in some cases to go from a TQFT to, I think just a PEPS type system. Um, so, I mean, that still doesn't answer the question of the infinite volume limit, but I, I th don't know if that's how general these types of constructions are. I think it's a bit case by case in terms of here is, here is our way in some cases to go from, uh, you know, I have a manifold, I triangulate, and then I build a lattice model uh, where somehow it's supposed to represent. No, no, um, but I, again, I mean, I want to completely ignore here uh, the lattice. I think the statement, as you write it in the in the chat, has to do only with continuous theories, a TQFT and a conformal field theory. Oh yeah, in, in terms so of that is, statement, that, that, is, that's probably true. Yes. Um, so, so is that, is, I think Sven is that, asking whether it's established at, at, yes. in that context. Oh, or is it also um, there? I think, uh, again, I'm just judging by second or third hand um, think, talks that I attended or something like that, but. I think in some cases you they can build a boundary theory, but it's not always gapless. In fact, I in fact, a lot of the time the boundary also turns out to be gapped, where gapped in the field theory sense, which um, I forget actually how that is defined, but there is a definition. Um, but maybe that ties into the fact that, you know, a sort of a bulk boundary duality or something like that, where you Ideally, one expects a gapped bulk with a gapless edge. In general, we probably would not expect it to always be the case, even if you have a non-trivial bulk. Mm -hmm. There's also a question, what you understand by a TQFT? I mean, the original definition of TQFT, QFT, say, by, by Atia, uh, uh, simply does not tell you what happens at the boundary. I mean, you associate, uh, associate uh, you don't associate any data to uh, to spatial manifolds with boundaries. So you can you can have uh, modified definitions which which tell you that you should specify more data. Uh, on the other hand, you you can also given TQFT, you can ask whether it is possible to somehow extend it to. To, to manifolds with boundary and uh, but I don't know whether uh, I mean in general I would expect this to be highly non-unique uh, uh, I, I think I think there are these conjectures uh, or maybe this is even established in some cases but I, I really don't know that that for some for some TQFTs there should there should be some abstraction to construct a, 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 bound, a boundary extension which is uh, which is gapped uh, so there is no not unique extension, but every extension should be gapless somehow. And uh, by the way, if you have a if you have some bulk theory, then you can also always imagine that uh, on the boundary you can have uh, uh, you you can you can add arbitrarily many additional degrees of freedom. So so this so these conjectures also involve the statement that that this. This, these gapless excitations that you have uh, on the boundary cannot be cancelled by adding some uh, additional degrees of freedom and gapping everything out. That's also a statement that I've read and that I've heard, that how it really relates to what we do in, in land systems, I, I don't quite know, but um, uh, for instance, does anyone know uh, uh, of um, uh, ladder systems with a gapped bulk phase, um, where you can you can you can really show that there is no um, terms in the Hamiltonian, say, and or maybe even other degrees of freedom that you can add near the edge, so that the spectrum is actually gap in its entirety uh, on, a, on a half system, a half space or whatever, a space with boundary. Um, I don't know, has anyone tried? 
Uh, but if you don't try, then, uh, then no, of course uh, not. <laughs> let, 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 me let me see. You need that. an idea, of course. I know. <laughs> let me see that. Uh, so, if you if you take a non-interacting system uh, with a gap, you have a parameter where uh, so you have uh, two two parts of the spectrum, and you have a situation where a gap. Uh, under a parameter, uh, one eigenvalue goes from the top all the way to the bottom. Uh -huh. So then you second quantize this uh, system and you look as a function of this parameter, what happened to the ground state. Yes, but the, but the statement would second. include that um, even if you, you uh, modify the Hamilton near the boundary, you will, you will not get rid of this eigenvalue that crosses all the way through and uh, yeah. prevents you from, from doing that, right? Um, and, you know, in some sense, this, is, this must be true, I suppose. It must be true for these systems with, with um, that people claim that is not possible. And they do it also, I think, by constructing invariants of some kind, but I, I have not looked at it. In, in detail. Mm. Okay, so your question was: Suppose we do have such a yes, such a state. How can we get rid of it? Well, uh, in some cases, for sure, I'm sure you can, right? Yeah. Um, but the claim is that in, in, in some cases you cannot, right? If, if the spec, um, and I believe that that has been studied in um, in the context of this, or some generalized uh, TQFTs, uh, I think. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, also very concretely, I think in the context of the integer quantum Hall effect, uh, I think that the bulk edge correspondence statements are pretty pretty general. Right. In what can happen along the along the boundary where you cut? I mean, I, I don't exactly know the conditions. There are some conditions, but clearly that you can add somehow localized potentials along the boundary that would not change the, the bulk edge correspondence. But what happens if you have interactions with people? Yeah, yeah, I mean, we're in a knowledge. I don't know how to study yeah. for the moment. So actually, it, it is expected that the situation will change. For example, there is this, uh, well, uh, Kitkowski Kitayev interaction, which is supposed to change, but not completely break everything down, uh, at least conjecturally. Uh, I, I, I didn't quite. Can you can you explain that a bit more? Are you referring to a particular paper? Maybe you can put a reference in the chat or something. People can. So, so there is a the, 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 there is the uh, I can dig up a reference uh, in, in a minute. But essentially, there is there are these systems of free fermions in some symmetric class which have a z topological invariant and uh, and then. Uh, uh, the the claim of Fitkowski and Kitayev uh, is that uh, uh, once the the interactions are turned on the in, the interaction is well the classification is reduced to Z8 in the sense that phases with the invariant differing by a multiple of eight actually become equivalent they can be connected by a path in the space of Hamiltonians but through interacting Hamiltonians. This is precisely the stability against uh, adding more degrees of freedom. So you put one more, you stack more and yeah. more eight chains, you apparently get back to the zero, zero class. So you, the same A3 class breaks down to, uh, from Z to Z4, and they're in a, a, an explicit path, uh, which, one can take from uh, uh, an explicit connecting path in the bulk, which uh, actually connects to um, sort of quantized system, uh, second quantized system, one particle system, second quantized one particle systems, which you, at the one particle level, you will believe they are different uh, according to the one particle topological indices and uh, uh, when you calculate the, I mean, there is this explicit 
path of interacting Hamiltonian, which hold, which keep the bulk, the many body uh, ground state gap open and connects these two guys. Yes. So does that, um, uh, let me see whether I understand this correctly. So does that mean that um, there's a, a definition of invariant that is somehow not extendable to the in interacting system? That's right. So the, in other words, the invariants built up from the uh, one particle Green's function, they are not stable. That's the morale of the of that construction. Because at the end, these winding numbers that are used to, particularly for the A3 class, they are built from the one particle Green's function. Mm -hmm. And it turns out that uh, even uh, uh, as, as you as you go as you go from one uh, path to another, the one particle Green's function okay needs to close. You can still hold the many body gap open. Just a quick comment on this point. So, if you remember Yoshko's talk from is a while ago now, but uh, you know you have this index which is Z two and then a homomorphism uh, yeah. H one and then a H two. If you substitute for the, your group uh, Z mod two, so your time reversal involution, where that is implemented anti-unitarily, um, then you and you follow that complicated stacking formula, then you'll precisely get Z mod eight as um, the uh, uh, invariant as the group that. Well, as the invariant of, um, I see. Uh, That's that. interesting. So, so what what does that mean? That uh, there are gapped quasi-free systems that are are not going to have generic stability. Is that, so that or or these invariants are defined in the well. I know how they. I mean, in principle, I heard the talk. <laughs> I saw the paper. I read the paper. <laughs> um, no, I have to. To, to check if it's uh, the interaction is quasi quasi local. Um, ah, okay, sure. I mean, we don't we don't want to interact with the universe or something. Yeah, or, that's right. <laughs> that's, it's uh, that's the big right. entangler in heaven. <laughs> <laughs> One thing. If it's cosmic, it is it is local. It is local. I see. It's a quartic interaction. Um, yeah, it, it's uh, quartic, but uh, in, in in their paper they go. They only analyze the boundary, and they show that they can uh, move the the states into the bulk. Uh, but I'm not sure if they made a statement about the the bulk. I think they showed that the, the that the gap never closes. I mean, because the the path they consider in the space of Hamiltonians is is uh, is such that actually during the time where the quartic interactions are turned on, uh, the system consists of the coupled uh, uh, pairs of lattice sites or something like that. So that, so, so that actually uh, you can diagonalize exactly because uh, uh, the wave yeah. function is a tensor product of... Uh, yeah, that, that, that's correct. So you start with chains which have uh, bonds horizontally and then you have a, a, a then you have a, a chain which has bonds vertically and you need eight of them. And now uh, there is a path uh, from the horizontal to this vertically bonded system. And there is a path from uh, uh, a system with uh, winding number uh, zero and a system with nine, winding number eight. Uh, not I see. So no. yeah, so no, eight and zero become equivalent. No, no, no. Yes, so this this system will have a uh, uh, z number uh, uh, winding number eight. Yet you can connect it to this uh, vertically bonded system, which has uh, winding number zero, uh, and never closing the bulk gap. So the the yeah the interaction is local and certainly you can you can achieve it by uh, I think four step uh, this quantum circuit. Uh, 
Well, so, so this definitely suggests that I didn't index as a Z8 index, as a Z8 index, not, not the Z index. So however, it's been, that apparently maybe you can define only due to special features of this non-interacting system. And there must be something about its construction that uses also, these features. Okay. You think you can define it in, in, the, in the interacting system? Uh, the full the full index the full z8 so chris just mentioned that if you take uh, the group yoshiko mentioned and you yeah but i i understood he said you get the z8 index yeah z8 yeah but you, bruno you're asking if whether the z can be That's defined not, right yes whether the z can be defined right uh, i mean that the is, z is just the chimera it's well a, i mean it's a ghost <laughs> maybe you can write something down but in terms of any sort of robustness i think um, it's That's a very different problem. question because, mm -hmm. I mean, precisely, you can make sense of this in a, in a robust way only when you're allowing for deformations within the single particle Hilbert space before you second quantize or something like that. Um, I mean, you know, that's still a useful thing, and yeah, like, I mean, and I can still. Um, but it's just about. that mm -hmm. you're uh, you're doing or you're answering a different question. Um, so it's not surprising then that you're going to get different. Um, yeah, but the single particle Hamiltonian is 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 a parameter in your many body interactions. Yeah, right? that's true. So if, unless you do something really drastic, I, I sort of think it should be okay. <laughs> but um, um, all right, this is something to look at. So yeah. for those of you who are interested in instability of Fermi systems, uh, sounds like something to look at interacting. Yes. So, um, precisely I, because of, uh, sorry, you know, you wanted to say something? Yeah, uh, I can dig up my notes for uh, for the A3 class because in that case, the, this interacting quartic potential is much more simpler than in Pipkowski paper. So then, uh, uh, okay, simplicity. I'd be, I'd be interested in having a look at understanding the better. Um, do, do you have it? Uh, uh, published somewhere this a3 example no it's only in my in my notes unfortunately your, your notes are, are uh, a pdf file <laughs> yeah they are uh, electronic but uh, since <laughs> okay then i changed so many tablets now i have to find the tablet <laughs> okay, okay. So, so, uh, one yeah um so it was slightly changed like a bit, but in an attempt to uh, offer somebody else's answer to all these difficulties, there's, um, there's sometimes an effective or pragmatic point of view, which is that um, after the dust has settled, um, the, the actual interesting topological invariants, if there are any of that left, uh, are precisely the ones for which some sort of bulk H or bulk defect correspondence uh, holds. And uh, this is in some sense um, my interpretation of the Kitaev idea that that you that some sort of uh, spectra, uh, in the sense of algebraic topology or uh, omega spectrum to be a bit more uh, uh, specific, um, become relevant, and and this is because it is almost axiomatic. So the 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 point of having this sort of uh, spectra uh, omega spectral structure is that you can get this generalized uh, homology or cohomology theories, and what these generalized homology or cohomology theories are, uh, essentially the only possible. Uh, um, suitably functorial constructions from category of spaces into groups, which will axiomatically enjoy the properties of locality, which of course we've uh, discussed is very, uh, very precious uh, 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 feature. And furthermore, a property of uh, inclusion exclusion, namely that if you divide a space into into pieces, uh, the sum of its parts, uh, together with a correction term on the intersection. I should precisely recover the, 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 the relevant data of the whole. And this is in some sense what the bulk edge correspondence is, is saying. And um, so overall, this is a pragmatic view because one has not given any microscopic explanation as to why uh, you should get such a theory, or indeed one has not yet specified what the generalized homology theory should be. But uh, from the axiomatic point of view, uh, it's a desirable answer. And, uh, in, in some sense, in the same spirit as the AQF, uh, attribute quantum field theory point of view, where they put in all these axioms of locality and, and uh, local operator algebra. Mm -hmm. and, 
and, and, and things like that. And then you have the difficulty of actually justifying or constructing interesting examples. All of it. So, so that, that, that's to partially answer uh, or add on to what Chris was saying some, some time ago about uh, this Kitaev okay. uh, point of view. And uh, I think in this talk, he also mentioned uh, Shiozaki says something about uh, why generalized homology theories should, should become relevant in this subject, uh, although we don't know which one. So, so not, not an answer, but just a perspective that I uh, gained from some, some other talks. Well, yes, one, one, okay, one question is uh, if we have the classification, why, why do we expect them to be groups? Like Antoine was. was um, it's also a pragmatic thing, <laughs> I think. And, so, uh, uh, Nigel, uh, and we also saw in uh, where in Chris' talk, operation that comes from tensoring. Oh, you want categories. Tensoring, yes, yes. tensoring that quickly. But other than that, uh, well, I mean, for long range entangled states, you do not expect a group, right? Um, it's only for these invertible guys, which are much sort of more simple to deal with. Um, yeah, because if you have anions, right, then there's no rule. You would not be expect to stack and trivialize. You can compose. You know, I mean, there's this sort yeah. of a notion of, of composition that uh, probably not. Which corresponds to taking tensor products of Hilbert spaces. So if the space of ground states is multi-dimensional on some manifolds, if you take tensor products, you increase the dimension even further. So there can not there can be no inverse for that operation. So, so basically it is at least a necessary condition for, for existence of inverse with respect to stacking operation that, that all ground state degenerates, all ground states have to be non-degenerate basically. Nigel, is it a semi-group or a group? <laughs> well, I mean, it, the monoid, I think. All I can say is that, that when Anton defines an invertible state the way he does, it's definitely going to be a group. Uh -huh. um, but, but you know, you want something like a group point, don't you? You said we should get categories instead of, uh, instead of just groups as, as the answers. If, and, if, if we go back to uh, the slide, uh, Bruno put on what uh, this homotopy then pi naught is not a group pi naught is just a set did I put anything yes. about this now, uh, now where is the group structure coming from uh, the wake up my, my iPad here So it, I think it, it comes a, a group once you have this uh, group group action and somehow you you look at a pi naught of a you build somehow a group and the pi naught of a group is a group but other than that is just a set so where are then these other algebraic structure comes come in. So in the Kitayev's conjecture, the space would be the loop space of some other space. And this is already sufficient to make pi not a group, even though uh, the space is not a topological group. Because also then pi not of this space is pi one of some other space. So, uh, and also pi two of some, another space so so in particular it should be a billion group that's right so this uh, almost uh, is implied that uh, these uh, loops are non contractible so somehow this topology uh, <laughs> this bana space we are looking at it has holes so we can we can wind loops around them if it is to, to look at this conjecture by Kitai. So this is I don't know whether it's a, a good story. Um, oh, Nigel, go ahead. I, I just wanted to say that if you just look at the invertible states, there's no reason why they should form an affine space. So, 
uh, or even a con connected space, and apparently they don't. So a connecting space, yes. Uh, do we have time for just one very quick question? Uh, yeah, well, so, I, so, so one way to determine when we've done it would be when all questions are fully answered. But it's probably <laughs> not a good recipe. <laughs> um, so formally, uh, you know, time's up for the session uh, today, and and I think we had a very oh, interesting yeah. talks and and a, and a great discussion and uh, uh, things to think about. Um, for for some of you, it's it, it's late, so. <laughs> Or very late or early already, perhaps. <laughs> um, so I, I think we should wrap up and, and reconvene tomorrow. Um, yes, I agree. That's good. Thank you. Thank Thanks you. Everyone. Yeah, thanks.